Hi, and welcome to the Wellness Effects training video where we specifically go over the CBC or the complete blood count. Now, the, there's a CBC uh, with differential. The white blood cells and differential will be talked about in another video. In this particular video, we're going to talk about the red blood cell or red blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit, MCV, MCH, MCHC, RDW, as well as platelets. Now, before we get into this really important panel, when looking at health, disease, and optimizing somebody's health, I want to show you the value of why critically looking at the CBC is so incredibly important for just about anybody that runs a blood chemistry today. The CBC is essentially looking for what we'll just refer to as anemic tendencies. Now, as an unlicensed practitioner, we can't diagnose anybody with anemia, but what anemia really is is an inability for the red blood cells to carry and deliver oxygen to all the cells of the body. And we'll talk about the many different ways and reasons why that can occur. There's many, many different types of anemia, but at each of their essence is an inability to deliver oxygen to the cells of the body. So right, I'll refer to this as an anemic tendency or functional anemia, but understand that regardless if it's a diagnosable anemia or just a tendency towards anemia, that it's really, at its basis, an inability to deliver oxygen to the cells of the body. And here's what I want to propose as why this is so critically important to look at. Now, what this represents is really just about any of the cells of the body, minus red blood cells, because they don't contain organelles, like the nucleus and mitochondria and, and many of the other organelles. <clears throat> Essentially, what we're looking at is, is really just basic, basic biochemistry. Glucose enters into a cell and goes through what's called glycolysis, which means the splitting of sugar. So uh, glucose, which is six carbon, uh, gets broken down into th uh, two three carbon pyruvate molecules. Now pyruvate can enter into what's called the mitochondria. And what you've probably heard about the mitochondria is it's the powerhouse of the cell. But what that really means that is, is that within the mitochondria, we're going to make something called ATP. And everybody's heard of ATP and considers it to be energy or they know it as adenosine triphosphate. But what I find people really lack the understanding of is what is ATP even used for in the first place? And understand that this cell could be a neuron in the brain. It could be a skeletal muscle cell of your biceps. It can be a hormone secreting cell. It can be a cell of your gastrointestinal tract. Any cell of the body, to do what that cell does, gets its energy from its ability to make ATP. ATP is made within this cell in order to run this cell. So the more ATP that this cell has, the better this cell can do what it does. Again, if it's a neuron in your brain, then that cell will be able to fire and act as a neuron. It, on the other hand, if it lacks ATP, this cell cannot do what this cell does. And if we're in the business of trying to optimize individuals' health, what we want to do is optimize their ability to produce ATP in any of the cells of the body. Lack of ATP in the heart may end up as heart disease. Lack of ATP in the brain might end up as something like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or ADD or ADHD. That really what we're looking at on a fundamental level, regardless of the symptoms, regardless of a condition that somebody has, is how well does this person make ATP to run the cell for every cell of the body to do what that cell does. You can see that if there is a deficiency in an ability to make ATP in this cell, then that cell will not work properly. If enough cells don't work properly, then it might result as symptoms. If even more cells stop working properly, then it may actually end up being an overt diagnosable disease. So what happens is, glucose is the preferred substrate, though you can use fatty acids and uh, amino acids to uh, generate ATP. Glucose comes into a cell, is split into two pyruvate molecules, and as a consequence of glycolysis, makes two ATP, and that's not very much ATP. Pyruvate then, under the right circumstances, can enter into the mitochondria, be converted into something called acetyl-CoA, which then goes through what's called the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. For every pyruvate molecule that goes into the citric acid cycle, only one ATP is made. So for every molecule of glucose, if you make two molecules of pyruvate and they each go through the citric acid cycle, they make two ATP. But right now, that's not very much ATP to run this cell. The real role of the citric acid cycle is to produce what's called electrons. And these electrons then get transferred to what's called the electron transport chain. 
There's another component of the electron transport chain that's known as oxidative phosphorylation. And as you can know by the first three letters of oxidative phosphorylation, that's where oxygen is really utilized. So what's happening then is the citric acid cycle is making electrons. Those are being transported over to the electron transport chain. And to break this down in a very simple uh, process, those electrons are transported down these proteins found in the inner mitochondrial membrane. But notice that the very last protein complex donates its electrons to oxygen. Now what this means is, if somebody has an anemic tendency, if they have an inability to deliver oxygen to the cells of the body, this last step, which involves oxygen, of all these processes, the very last step of the, uh, ox or the oxidative phosphorylation electron transport chain, it uses oxygen. If oxygen is not present, what happens is the electrons start to back up. They can't, don't, they can't be donated in order to really make ATP. And by the way, the electron transport chain is involved in producing about 32 to 36 ATP. So whereas glycolysis is two, the citric acid cycle for each pyruvate is only one, really where the bulk of your ATP comes from in order for this cell to do what this cell does in an optimal and healthy way comes from the electron transport chain. And for the electron transport chain to work properly, oxygen is required at the very last step. If oxygen is not present, the electrons tend to back up in the electron transport chain. They have nowhere to donate it to because oxygen is not here. If those tend to back up, the citric acid cycle tends to back up. If the citric acid cycle tends to back up because it can't make electrons to even be donated in the first place, pyruvate tends to not go into the mitochondria and instead can be converted into lactate or lactic acid. You can see that this process is dependent on, there's a number of micronutrients, B vitamins and CoQ10, that's involved in this process, but oxygen is absolutely critical and mandatory as the very last step right before ATP is made using the electron transport chain. So I say all this because you can pick up functional anemia, anemic tendencies, or let's just call an inability to deliver oxygen to the cells of the body using a CBC. Those markers that we mentioned before looks at anemic tendencies, looks at somebody's ability to deliver oxygen to the cells of their body. If they, for some reason, are deficient in their ability to deliver oxygen to the cells of the body, one thing that you can accurately uh, or at least assume is that all of the cells of the body are not working as well or as optimally as they possibly can. So in the rest of this video, we're going to talk about all the different markers of the CBC, what can cause them to uh, be either high or low, looking at uh, inability, why they can't bring oxygen to the cells of the body, uh, especially from a nutritional perspective, and really how to critically evaluate this very inexpensive, very overlooked portion of a blood chemistry that physiologically may be argued that it's one of the more important parts of a blood chemistry. So before talking about the specific markers on a CBC, let's just talk about what blood really is in the first place and what's really being evaluated. So if a sample of blood is taken, you know that it fills up the vial and it looks red. Then in the process of laboratory testing, they centrifuge it down, which they spin it. And then what happens is the heavy stuff essentially goes to the bottom and the lighter stuff stays at the top. The things that go to the bottom are called the formed elements. And the formed elements is really just a fancy way of saying the cells that's found in blood. Those cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And those are all found in the formed elements. Now the formed elements is said to be about 45% of the total volume of blood after they've uh, been centrifuged and have sunk down to the bottom. The remaining approximately 55% then is considered to be plasma. Plasma is the aqueous solution of which you find everything else in the blood other than the actual cells themselves, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. Plasma is said to be approximately 92% water. We'll talk about this in per as it pertains to looking at a CBC and actually finding somebody that may be dehydrated. The plasma is about 92% water, followed by about 7% proteins. Now of those proteins, about 60% is albumin, about 35% is called globulins, and then about 4% is fibrinogen, which is talked about in another video, and then the remaining 1% is everything, uh, all the other different proteins, like angiotensinogen, uh, plasminogen, and a number of different proteins. So plasma is about 92% water, about 7% proteins, and if you do the math, that leaves about 1% that's left, and that 1% is everything else. So glucose, for example, can be found in the plasma. 
Hormones can be found in the plasma. Uh, minerals, electrolytes, organic acids can all be found in the plasma, but the plasma is mostly water, about 92%, about 7% of a variety of different kinds of proteins, and then everything else that you would find in the blood is in that 1% or other category. The formed elements, again, will be largely, uh, the vast majority of the formed elements will be red blood cells. This very small layer right here uh, is called the Buffy coat, and that's considered to contain the remaining of the formed elements, which is the white blood cells and the platelets. And you can see there's a lot less platelets and white blood cells than there are red blood cells as a part of the formed elements. So now let's start to talk a little bit about the CBC markers. So now let's talk a little bit about the specific indices found on a CBC. For starters, you have the RBC. Now this is often known as the red blood cell count, although uh, they're actually red blood cell corpuscles. This is, the RBC is an indication of how many red blood cells this person has. And we'll talk about the different things that can cause uh, excess red blood cells or deficient red blood cells, and as well as how red blood cells are even made in the first place. But the red blood cell, or RBC, is how many red blood cells this person has. Essentially, are they making too many, or are they not making enough? The next marker is hemoglobin. Now we'll also talk a little bit more about hemoglobin and its synthesis and its role really in this particular uh, panel. But hemoglobin is a molecule. It's a molecule found inside red blood cells. And to just give you an idea of how many there are, there's about 280 million molecules of hemoglobin per red blood cell, which is, it's kind of hard to even fathom. But hemoglobin is a specific molecule that's synthesized and its job is to bind onto oxygen go carry it around the body within the red blood cell <clears throat> and then deliver it where necessary to the different cells of the body. So red blood cell is the number of red blood cells this person has. Hemoglobin is a molecule and is therefore measured in a weight. You can actually weigh how much hemoglobin somebody has. And so it's how much hemoglobin this person has uh, in the, the amount of red blood cells that have been sampled. The next one is called hematocrit. Now, hematocrit used to be called, and still is on some blood chemistries, the packed cell volume. And the hematocrit then really is measured either in a volume or sometimes a percentage. But the hematocrit is the packed cell volume, meaning in the total sample of blood that was drawn, how high, if you will, how much or percentage or volume of the total amount is the actual formed elements or the cells themselves. So the hematocrit, and we'll talk more about that one as well, but the hematocrit uh, can look at, for example, let's say somebody has a deficient uh, red blood cell production. They might have low red blood cells. Uh, they would likely have low hemoglobin because hemoglobin is within red blood cells, and therefore low red blood cells means low hemoglobin. But you can see that if this person had a deficient amount of red blood cells, that the, hemoglo or the hematocrit would actually be lower. So you might see a low hematocrit on that individual. Uh, we'll talk about some reasons why hematocrit may not be one of the best markers when looking at a CVC for anemic tendencies. But red blood cell is the number of red blood cells. Hemoglobin is the amount or weight of hemoglobin that's found in that particular sample. And the hematocrit is the percent or the packed cell volume, essentially how many red blood cells or formed elements they have compared to the total volume of blood drawn. And then these next three are actually calculations based on these first three indices. And they all start with M, which stands for mean or average. And what these are essentially saying is, if in this individual you were to take the average red blood cell, how much, what volume would it have? MCV stands for mean corpuscular volume. So how large or how small or normal size is the average red blood cell in this person? Again, based on calculations from the previous three indices. So the MCV is the mean corpuscular volume, how, basically how large or how small it is. The next one's called the mean corpuscular hemoglobin. In the average single red blood cell from this person, the one that was the most average of all their red blood cells, if calculated, what is the hemoglobin amount in this particular red blood cell, in the average one? Again, calculated by these three uh, previous ones. The MCHC is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Now, while that may sound like mean corpuscular hemoglobin, the mean corpuscular hemoglobin is more of a weight of how much this actually contains. The MCHC, or mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, is often listed as a percentage and is essentially saying what percentage of this red blood cell is made up of hemoglobin. 
Now it's said that the average red blood cell is about 33% or about a third full of hemoglobin. The rest of it is cytosol and enzymes. So the MCHC on average should be around 33%. And that's because again, the average red blood cell is said to have about a third uh, full of hemoglobin. The last one is the RDW. And that stands for the red cell distribution width. And what this is really looking at is the variance in size of the red blood cells. Now, for reasons of optimal oxygen and gas exchange in the body, the red blood cells should have a fairly standardized uh, size, if you will, uh, for reasons of getting into the capillaries and really delivering oxygen, and, like I said, gas exchange. But in the case of a nutritional anemia, where somebody is maybe not making the red blood cells the way that they should, what you can see is an increase in the variance of the size. Now, a normal RDW may be in the neighborhood of about 13%, suggesting that in the average healthy adult uh, blood, uh, red blood cell production process, there's a little bit of variance, but not a lot, only about 13%. And what I've done up here is to show you uh, what may end up being a normal RDW or a high RDW. Now, if all the red blood cells are fairly uniform in their size as they're being produced from the uh, red bone marrow, then that would be considered to be a normal RDW, that all the red blood cells are being manufactured in a fairly uniform size, and therefore the variance between these is very, very little. On the other hand, if you look at the size variance of these two cells here, you have some very, very small cells and some maybe normal cells or maybe larger cells. In this particular case, there's a larger variance between the size of the cells as they're being produced, and therefore this individual would have a high, a high RDW. RDW is actually really hand, handy in evaluating if it's an anemic tendency based on a nutritional deficiency or in the case of maybe red blood cells are being lost or broken down, which we'll talk about later in the video. So RDW stands for red cell distribution width and is essentially looking at the variance in size as these red blood cells are being produced in the red bone marrow. So again, <clears throat> the red blood cell is how many red blood cells this person has. Are they making too many or too little? Hemoglobin is the amount of hemoglobin per sample that was taken in a weight. Hematocrit is the packed cell volume, is what percentage is of formed elements compared to the total amount of, of volume of that particular sample. Mean corpuscular volume is the average cell size. Is it too big, is it too small, or is it normal? Mean corpuscular hemoglobin is how much does the average red blood cell in this individual have, again, by weight. And then the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is how full of this, uh, not in weight, of this red blood cell is this percentage of hemoglobin. And the RDW is the red cell distribution width, looking at the variance of size. Now, I just want to make two quick comments, and then we'll move on to another part. <clears throat> when looking at, and this is a real general comment, when looking at if this person has an anemic tendency or not, the first three markers, red blood cell, hemoglobin, and hematocrit, will tell you if there's an anemic tendency or not. In other words, does this individual have the ability to optimally deliver oxygen to the cells of their body? In general, if these three are low, or below the laboratory reference range, then what you're looking at is an anemic tendency, an inability to deliver oxygen to the cells of the body. Now that being said, there's a variety of different patterns that can occur here. Hemoglobin is actually the most important of these particular three, and I'll explain why as we go through this video. But what you're really looking at, since hemoglobin has the ability to bind onto oxygen, hematocrit may be normal, may be low, maybe even a little bit high in some cases. The red blood cells aren't as accurate necessarily. Of these three, you would like to see all three be low in order to say this person has an inability to deliver oxygen to the cells of the body, but of these three, hemoglobin is the most important one. If hemoglobin is low, regardless if the red blood cells or hematocrit is normal or not, this is the one you're looking at because hemoglobin has the ability to bind onto oxygen to transport uh, oxygen to the, the cells and the tissues of the body. So hemoglobin is the most important. So when you look at the RBC hemoglobin and hematocrit, if they're low, then that person has some type of anemic tendency. Then you look at the MCV, MCH, and MCHC, and this will tell you why. Meaning if the person has, let's say, smaller than normal red blood cells, and, uh, or more pale, for example, red blood cells, it doesn't have a lot of uh, hemat or hemoglobin in it, then that can tell you why they have this type of anemia.
On the other hand, if they have larger than normal cells, and maybe it's, it's, they're too red because it appears that there's too much hemoglobin in there, then again, this will tell you why this person has this anemic tendency. So the, the first three, RBC hemoglobin hematocrit, says whether or not there's an anemic, anemic tendency there. And the MCV, MCH, and MCHC tell you why possibly that this anemic tendency is there. Now, a quick comment about this. The red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit, if slightly elevated, not, not grossly outside of the laboratory reference range, can indicate two things that are most common in today's society. One is dehydration, and I'll explain that in just a second. The other one is high testosterone. So in a woman, for example, that might have PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome or ovary syndrome, these three might be high because women with PCOS tend to have high testosterone. Men in general tend to have higher numbers of the RBC hemoglobin and hematocrit, but there also may be a male that is on testosterone replacement therapy, and very often they will have an elevated RBC hemoglobin and hematocrit. The other possibility is dehydration. Now the really, really important thing to consider here is if the red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit are elevated, that that can mask an anemia, meaning that there is, for example, dehydration. If dehydration is present, these will tend to be high, even though somebody may have anemia. Or in another scenario, these may be low because of an, an anemic tendency, but they're dehydrated, which might make them high, and that person actually has normal red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit. And that's part of the art of really looking at, critically, a CBC. Let me just quickly describe why during dehydration the RBC hemoglobin and hematocrit can be high. <clears throat> Let's say this is a normal sample and it's an oversimplification, but in order for, uh, for reasons of standardization and really accurately comparing somebody's blood to what's considered to be normal, they have to um, have a certain amount of blood present. Uh, and like again, for uh, reasons of standardization. So let's say, for example, somebody was dehydrated. And remember that the plasma is 92% water. So if somebody's dehydrated, they may have less plasma. But to actually bring up the level of uh, volume of, of a sample so that it can be standardized and therefore compared to other norms, because the person might have lower than normal plasma levels because of dehydration requires that a sort of a larger sample is to be drawn. And what you can see here is that if this is the hematocrit, let's say this is the exact same person, once when they were hydrated and once while they were dehydrated. The red blood cell amount or the hemoglobin in the red blood cell or the hematocrit has never changed per se. Nothing's changed physiologically except that they're dehydrated. So it appears as though they have more red blood cells. Therefore, they have more hemoglobin per red blood cell and have, therefore, a higher hematocrit. But in reality, what's happening is they actually have less plasma because of dehydration and it just appears as though they have more. This concept is called hemoconcentration, that because of the amount that they have to draw, essentially, in order for standardization to compare to their norms, they have to pull more, essentially, so it looks like there's more of a thing than there actually is if the person were adequately hydrated. So I'll say that again. Red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit may be somewhat elevated if somebody's dehydrated. How do you know? You can look at other portions of the blood chemistry. For example, uh, albumin, and BUN specifically can be a little bit elevated if somebody's dehydrated. So if you have high red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit, and you look and see that their albumin may be close to five, their BUN may be close to, let's just say 26, 25, what you may be looking at is dehydration. And that's very common in today's society. Sometimes even despite the amount of water that people are consuming, you may find that somebody is actually dehydrated regardless of how much blood, uh, the water they're consuming by looking critically at this really amazing tool of blood chemistry and specifically the CBC. So now let's go into the next portion of this video where we talk about how red blood cells are even formed in the first place. So now let's talk about where red blood cells even come from in the first place. And this is actually really important to understand is how they're manufactured and the different things that are required in order to manufacture red blood cells to really, again, be able to critically evaluate the, the CBC. So red blood cell production occurs in the bone marrow, in the red bone marrow to be specific. And this is an overly simplified view. But essentially what happens is from what's called originally uh, hematopoietic stem cells, these cells have, if you notice, a very, very large nucleus. Now, in, in very simplistic terms, the role of the nucleus is protein synthesis. And what we're really trying to get to is a fully matured red blood cell without a nucleus that's filled with cytosol, enzymes, and hemoglobin is really what we're going after. So here what's happening 
is the nucleus is very, very large in this, these original cells as they're differentiating in the bone marrow. And the nucleus, again, being involved with protein synthesis, is making proteins. Now, if you understand the term hemoglobin, what hemoglobin really is, is a heme molecule, which we'll talk about, and globin. And globin is a protein chain. So in this original uh, cell here, what's happening is the nucleus is actively producing large amounts of globin, large amounts of the protein that eventually heme can bind onto to form hemoglobin. So at this particular phase, uh, when they stain these, it's very, very blue because uh, proteins will tend to take up this very blue dye. And these are called basophilic at this point. But at this phase, it's a large nucleus, very actively making proteins uh, without any heme really attaching yet until it gets to this next stage. And hopefully the video picks this up. But notice two things are happening. One is the nucleus is actually getting smaller. And this is uh, due to a couple of very important nutrients, folic acid and B12 that it's called nuclear maturation. And for the nucleus, the DNA to fully mature requires B12 and folic acid, which we, and we'll talk about as it pertains to a CBC. At this phase here, what you can see is there are uh, beginning to see some red speckles as well as the blue ones. The nucleus is still fairly substantial in its size. It's still making uh, globin, still making those proteins. On the other hand, what you see is that heme now is attaching to those globin protein chains and starting to form small amounts of hemoglobin. Now, if the step continues, you can notice again, what's happening is not only is the cell shrinking, but the nucleus is shrinking, again, in the presence of B12 and folic acid. And then at this phase, the nucleus is so small that it's really not making proteins anymore. And this is really why you don't see many of the uh, globin chains just by themselves in this particular cell. Now, this is the edge of the bone, let's say. In the bone marrow, <clears throat> this particular cell, which is called a reticulocyte, gets ejected from the uh, bone marrow and is now in the bloodstream. And after a couple of days, this reticulocyte, not a fully formed red blood cell, the last thing that it needs to do to become a matured red blood cell is eject the nucleus. So this reticulocyte exists in the bone marrow, also exists in the bloodstream for in the neighborhood of one to three days, ejects its nucleus, and now is a fully formed red blood cell. And a red blood cell is essentially a phospholipid membrane and cytosol on the inside without any organelles, no nucleus, no mitochondria, cytosol that has enzymes as well as a bunch of hemoglobin. So this is how red blood cell synthesis uh, is created. Now let's see nutritionally where some of these issues can arise. Well, as I already said, if somebody lacks B12 and or folic acid, <clears throat> that's required for what's called nuclear maturation. That without B12 or folic acid, the nucleus doesn't shrink. And if the nucleus doesn't shrink, what ends up happening is this individual will have a larger than normal red blood cell. And the reason why it's larger than normal is because it didn't fully mature, because it was going to differentiate but never really did, it has excess amounts of cytoplasm or excess amounts of cytosol and is a larger than normal red blood cell. It's almost as if it's too full of stuff. Now this is what's called to be macrocytic, large cell anemia. Macrocytic and if it's very red in color, uh, it's called hyperchromic. It's, a, it's too red for a red blood cell. So macrocytic and hypochromic tend to go together in terms of anemia. The most common cause from a nutritional perspective is either B12 and or folic acid deficiency. The reason why is because the nucleus doesn't mature. If it doesn't mature, it keeps making the stuff it was making, which makes for a too large, too full uh, red blood cell. Now, on the other hand, <clears throat> the other major component of this is hemoglobin. And as you can imagine, if this red blood cell was doing what it was supposed to do, the nucleus was making globin as it should, but let's say somebody lacked heme. So what really is heme? Heme is essentially a organic molecule, uh, which means it contains carbons, and it's uh, referred to, in terms of its synthesis, a, uh, por a polyporphyrin, a polyporphyrin molecule. It's actually a very uh, involved process to make heme, uh, requiring things like vitamin B6, uh, requiring uh, the mineral zinc in order to manufacture it. But then one of the very last stages is this polyporphyrin ring needs to have iron attached to it. And only when iron atta is attached to it, now this can be called heme. This heme molecule now can attach to a, a globin chain, a protein chain, to be called hemoglobin. So what is involved in making heme then? If somebody lacks vitamin B6, if they lack zinc, 
or more commonly, if they lack iron for some reason, you can't make heme. So without heme, you can't make hemoglobin. And without hemoglobin being manufactured adequately, what ends up happening is a smaller than normal red blood cell. And because it's smaller, this is referred to as microcytic, small cell. And because hemoglobin is what binds to oxygen and gives the red blood cells their red pigment, is often also called hypochromic. So microcytic and hypochromic anemias tend to go together. Reason why is because they lack hemoglobin on the inside. They lack hemoglobin because either of a B6 deficiency, which we'll talk about, a zinc deficiency, or an, and more commonly, an iron deficiency. If you lack any of those three things, you can't make heme. If you can't make heme, you can have all the globin you want, but it's not going to bind to heme, and therefore you don't have hemoglobin. It's going to be a smaller than normal cell because it lacks the adequate amounts of hemoglobin, and it will tend to be more pale because it lacks hemoglobin, lacks oxygen binding, and therefore it lacks the color of a normal red blood cell called microcytic, sometimes hypochromic anemia. <clears throat> now, in terms of where you can decide what different types of anemia it is, again, the uh, red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit will tell you if they have a tendency towards anemia, and the MCV, MCH, and MCHC will tell you uh, what type of anemia they may have. So here's how this really works. The MCV, mean corpuscular volume, is telling you the size of the cell. If the MCV is high, that means that it's a larger than normal cell, and what you're looking at then is a macrocytic anemia. So if you hear the term macrocytic or microcytic, that MCV is really telling you that. If it's excessively high and therefore large, that would be macrocytic anemia. If the MCV is small, or I should say if the MCV is low, then you're talking about a smaller than normal red blood cell and it'd be microcytic. So the terms macrocytic and microcytic really come from the MCV. If it's high, it's macrocytic. If it's low, it's microcytic. Then these next two refer to the chromicity or color of the red blood cells. So whether it's hyperchromic or hypochromic comes from the MCV and the MCHC because what these are really saying is the average red blood cell in this individual, how much total hemoglobin does it have, and what percentage of hemoglobin is that particular red blood cell. So if hemoglobin is low, for example, then this might be a pale cell, and therefore the MCH and MCHC would be to determine if it was hypochromic, if it was low. If the MCH, MC, uh, excuse me, MCH and MCHC were high, and this is indicating that there seems to be an abundance of hemoglobin in the cell, and therefore would be hyperchromic. So as you can see, the uh, macrocytic or microcytic comes from the size of the cell itself. Is it too big or too small? The MCH, MCHC refers to the color of the cell. Is it too red or is it too pale, for example? So that's where the terms mi macrocytic, microcytic, and hyperchromic or hypochromic come from. Uh, and as we'll talk about in a second, if the red blood cell, hemoglobin, and hematocrit are all low, indicating some kind of anemia, but the MCH, MCV, MCH, MCHC are normal, then it might be considered to be a normocytic, meaning normal sized cell, normochromic, meaning normal colored cell, but for some reason the red blood cell, hemoglobin, and hematocrit are low. So that's where some of those terms come from. And now let's take a, a little closer look at some of these markers. 